House of Correction by Howard Barker with Juliet Stevenson, Jenny Stoller, Victoria Wicks, David Bradley, and Nicholas Leprevo. As for this room, I think eight beds in here. This is my room. Or ten. Yes, five along each wall. And in the centre, when we are overwhelmed, when the casualties are streaming through the doors, we can use mattresses or straw. This is my room. It is your room, yes. Of course, however meticulous our plans, we shall discover them to be inadequate. Our resources will be drained. That is the nature of the crisis. We shall move like ghosts. Our characters, our appetites will be suspended as we stagger under the effects of sleeplessness. We shall not know ourselves. I do so want to triumph. I do so want to discover the extent of my magnificence. Don't you? Yes. But it's my room. And certainly this peace could not continue. Impossible. It was becoming old. Oh, intolerable. Intolerable, yes. It was as if everyone knew. I cannot wait to see your... To witness your... Dear one. To share in your... I can't find the word. Sorry, I can't find the word. Don't say it then. Wait, witness, and describe it afterwards. If there is an afterwards... This house has several hundred rooms. Several hundred. And she... Listen. Yes. A plane. Leaflets. Another leaflet raid. Perhaps. Perhaps leaflets. Every time we hear a plane, we think leaflets, leaflets again. I'll call the servants. Call them, yes. Leaflets. Leaflets. Yes. Do you read them at all? I know it is forbidden, but all the same, sometimes you see. You can't help seeing. The and... poetry. Yes. But there are other truths than poetry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if poetry is truth at all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Such as that I have attempted suicide not once, but five times. They know. They lifted me from ponds or cut me down from beams in barns. Embarrassing for me, for them. Five times and we shall need that bed. Pick up. Pick up the leaflets. Everyone. You cannot have the bed. The bed belongs to me. You occupy it, certainly. But the crisis alters our priorities. The bed mattered. The bed was everything. And now the bed is not. Arthur! You hear this voice. You're walking down a corridor. You're in the orchard. Cleaning, polishing, unblocking a drain. And there's this voice. <laughs> It travels. God knows why. It's not so very... <laughs> like some tap running in the night. Some plumbing in a desolated place. Possibly a bath. Yes, a bath left running by a man who's died. A bath of useless questions. The crisis is just another pretext for her to talk about herself. No. Don't accuse me. I can't help myself. She can't. And if I don't speak, I'll strike her. You have struck her. I have, and I was sorry. She also has a soul. She has a soul, and I hate it. What am I to do with all this linen? Frequently, I experience irritation when I deal with you. How many bandages does she want? But I don't advertise my irritation. Advertise it if you want to. I don't want to. But the tolerance I feel towards you is... Tolerance? Yes, Tolerance, and I... Oh! I'll apologise for that. Oh, let me apologise for that. How hateful to be tolerated. It's coming to an end, apparently. It is, is it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I can't think why we need so many bandages. She wants my room. Two hundred rooms are not sufficient, evidently, but she wants... My room. Why? What is so special about this room? More baskets! Only what has happened in this room makes her determined to obliterate it. Who 
Who are you? This is private property. It says so on a notice. Can't you read, or has the notice fallen down? I need water. Obviously, the notice fell down in the winter. I thought those gales were strong. What strong gales? I can't help. I'm bedridden. To be precise, it is not I that needs water. I have a horse. Bedridden, but still she claims the bed. The horse needs water. It's a dancing horse. It was not bred for distances. Well, if there's no water, I must. There must be water here. You must oblige me. I am a courier on a dancing horse. You have identified the first of many peculiarities that attend on this particular undertaking. Are there others? I don't speak much. I keep my wisdom to myself. Several. Name another. The stable was full of horses, any one of which could easily outdistance mine. Younger animals in good condition are familiar with the road. Mine has rarely been outside the show arena. Fascinating, but I must not become excited. Does yours walk on hind legs? And what is wrong with motorbikes? <laughs> that struck me as odd, and odder still that in the first place I was ordered to walk. Walk? Yes. The dancing horse was a concession to me, a reward for my long service. I must have water, and God help anyone who instructs me. There's a horse in the yard. It dances. Have you seen the horse? It dances. Some strangers here. On its hind legs, apparently. But who? I denied him water, but he became coercive. Who did? The courier. Courier. Give him water, whoever he is, and tell him to go. We have no time to waste on strangers. Not now. Not with a crisis. Oh, There's so much to do. Why did you say there was no water? There are three troughs and a standpipe in the yard. These leaflets fall in such profusion. It is as if the enemy were driven to excess by the certain knowledge who declined to read them. It is forbidden to read them. Yes. And anyway, I don't like poetry. But then they have entirely wasted their efforts. In my case, certainly. On the other hand, others may well be susceptible. What does she mean? She doesn't like poetry. Much of what the government decrees is correct, even if it doesn't always seem so at the time. Sometimes his decisions appear arbitrary or illogical. She has a cupboard full of poetry. One puzzles over the peculiar and contradictory nature of its legislation, thinking some error must have occurred, if not at the point of decision, then in the system of communications. An official misreading a letter in a word. A typist momentarily losing concentration when a man she loves appears in view. Invariably, the error is our own in not possessing the subtlety of mind to match the complex mechanisms of the ministry. At least this has been my own experience. Others may disagree. So there is a reason why you have no motorbike. I don't know. And being denied a motorbike, you are also denied a horse. I have a horse. You have a horse, but it prefers to dance on its hind legs. Yes, but the obvious drawbacks of my being supplied with a performing horse as a mount are, in my case, amply compensated for. By what? By what? I feel sure the citizen messenger must. Be... What is he saying? On the one hand, that the decision to supply him with a dancing horse reflects the as yet indecipherable wisdom of the government department that concerns itself with messengers, but on the other hand, that he has himself discovered means by which to frustrate precisely these complex and Byzantine arrangements. For example, by placing the horse on a railway truck. Is that what he's saying? Be quiet, you're an idiot. I can only say that in selecting me to bear this particularly important message, the provision of an apparently imperfect mount was negated to a considerable extent by my well-known expertise in cross-country riding, my knowledge of the effect of seasonal rainfall on the heights of rivers and so on. I admit, as we plunged through bracken and galloped over estuaries, I pondered these seeming contradictions, but to no avail. All will become clear later, I have no doubt, if not to me, to others. Will it? Will it become clear, however? We have delayed you by this inquisition on the nature of your vocation, Mr... Gdansk. Mr. Gdansk, and now you will be obliged to employ even more of your special skills to compensate for time lost at this unscheduled stop. Who says it was unscheduled? 
or looked at from another point of view, even if it were unscheduled, it might nevertheless be true that in stopping he evaded an encounter with high women, murderers, those who prey on messengers, and devotees of dancing horses who would most certainly have detected in its prancing style the origins of this particular animal, mud-spattered and unberibboned as it certainly oh, must be. Oh, do cease this! Oh, do cease! And she says she dislikes poetry! The crisis! Oh, the crisis! Terrible cleanliness of the crisis. They have stopped. The servants. Look at them. Pick up. Pick up. Look the way they cluster around the door. Pick up. Me. I have to go. Yes, you are a messenger. How you must suffer the ordeal of being stationary. You must go, obviously. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> How horrible that man made me. I was unfamiliar to myself. You are always saying that. Am I? As if there was another you. And this other you was, what, immaculate? And we, cooks, messengers, dustmen, etc., we spoil this other you? We smudge and smear it with our presence? Yes. Well, perhaps you do. Perhaps it should be spoiled. Perhaps the crisis is precisely what... Oh, God! Oh, God! He has left his wallet! Run out here! Yes? Stop that and run out here! <laughs> what is funny? Is it funny that we must now go about our business in the certain knowledge that at any moment some stranger will burst in and throw us into total disarray, distracting us from the meticulous and necessary organisation of... And you cannot have that bed! You cannot occupy that bed like that! Like what? How should I occupy it? I don't know. You want me horizontal? I don't know. I only... Shh, no. Yes. Shh. Yes, yes, yes. How absurd... I am unsettled by a single interruption when the crisis, when it comes, will consist precisely of interruption, will be nothing but perpetual interruption, interruption to the extent that we shall cease to recognise it as such. Did you find him? Gone, Miss. Yes, no doubt he leapt into the saddle, dug in his spurs and... I'll hang his satchel on the gate. Yes, we need not even see him. He can... Peculiar. Snatch it at a gallop. Peculiar. What is? What is peculiar? I'm afraid to speak. So often I am afraid to speak. Good. You have had a lifetime of speaking. He has. He's spoken too much. Yes, far too much. And everything I said was thieved by others. God knows why. Because it was a wealth. And all that's wealth is stolen. Yes. Yes. Peculiar, because what courier worthy of the name ever removes his satchel? Is the satchel of a courier not the vital element of his anatomy? Is it not more intimate to him than his liver or his kidney? He might as well have left his eyes lying on the table. Possibly he is not a courier, therefore, but someone masquerading as a courier. The enemy? Well, certainly the enemy. Has agents skilled in impersonating couriers, but they would not, I dare say, mount these impostors on circus horses. They would, unless I underestimate their genius for complication, place them on motorbikes. Motorbikes of precisely the same manufacture as our own. We could always look in it. I don't think we should look in it. I don't think we should permit ourselves to be distracted from the task in hand by speculating as to whether this intruder was a proper courier or not. Who cares if he is genuine? And if he is an enemy, what is that to us? The crisis will at once obliterate any distinction between the enemy and those we call our own. Surely that is an aspect of its magnificence. Anyway, it's locked, the satchel. It has a massive lock on it. Who's got the key? Shut up, or I shall tip you out of bed and you can crawl about <laughs> on all fours, arguing and... Why are you disputing? Such a... He enrages me! He is the thing that makes me ache for death! Why was my satchel not hung from the gate? Given the loss of precious time incurred by my error in forgetting it, and the further loss entailed in dismounting, tethering my horse, and coming through the courtyards to this place in order to retrieve it, it would seem proper and responsible to have hung it from a nail, or better still, driven a stake into the ground so that I might have swept it up into my arms without quitting the saddle. Oh, oh, We consider.
considered all those things, didn't we? We must get on. We must get on. We concluded, however, that the contents of the satchel must be of such significance, not to mention value, that to expose them to the risk of theft by hanging them from a pole would be a greater recklessness than the recklessness of... I like your face. It is, however, coated in dust. I'll wash it. I'll kiss your mouth if you... Women must be forever. You left your satchel and I was the reason, obviously. Feel me beneath my skirt. Feel me. My name is Lindsay, but give me another. I'll take it as my own. I have a room. It's on the second staircase going east. You are too generous. Not at all. I must... However, refrain from losing further time. But that's absurd. Uh, is it? Absurd to say you must not lose further time when you have already forfeited God knows how long by your own incompetence. And now you are quite prepared to offend the laws of hospitality by... Servants, how perfidious they are. Everything about them is deceit. Weariness, gratitude even. Pure deceit. I find it fascinating. Mr. Godanks is staying for a little... I say little... Why not a great deal of refreshment? Offering to help a servant, believing in the appearance of exhaustion, which they so love to affect, only offends them. They prefer to induce in you a sense of pity, which can't be acted on. They long to burden you with guilt. I must uh, see to my horse. Yes. The sole advantage of a circus animal must be its relative immunity to taking fright, but... Low-flying aircraft might cause her to rear, and given the antiquity of this place, pluck the ring out of the wall. Yes, but are you coming back? I ask, because I know I shall be more than a little piqued of having gone to the expense of time and energy in making you a sandwich. You simply leave your satchel, won't you? He despises you. I don't think so. Yes, he despises you. And the more you... I don't think he despises me at all. Don't slap me! Don't! You must stop slapping people! Leave her. Let her be loved if she can manage it. Let her turn her life upon a sandwich. <laughs> yes, let me. <laughs> What is this place? It resembles a convent. And like many convents, it seems at first glance to be fortified. The moat, for example, whilst stagnant now, suggests some military function, but its width is insufficient to discourage access to the walls, and the walls themselves, whilst being inordinately thick, lack height. A determined thief could make his way into the heart of it, given he was not discouraged by the puzzling nature of the courtyards none of which is connected to another except in a wholly arbitrary way. Notwithstanding this, it might well be a convent, since I have observed not a few convents are located in buildings the original function of which had little or nothing to do with the service of God. On the other hand, where is the bell? The crucifix. Unless some persecution has obliged the women to conceal their practices, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that, despite appearances, this place is not a convent at all, but rather... You require a sandwich? This is a sandwich. I'm grateful. Don't please take too long to eat the sandwich. Don't take too long to eat it. I want to wash the plate. <laughs> yes? <laughs> what is funny? There is a crisis. Because of the crisis, there is rather little time. The washing of plates, for example, will become, possibly, I don't know, an indulgence, a nostalgia. I see nothing the funny horse whatsoever. Was still tethered, I suppose. It was still tethered, yes. He is, in any case, unlikely to want to eat this sandwich slowly, given the greater urgency that now attends upon his enterprise. Isn't that so? Having gone without the satchel and been obliged to retrace your steps, you must be frantically impatient to make up lost time. 
It stands to reason. Well, certainly, it, it would seem so, given your own estimation of the situation. I, I, I don't criticise. One who is relatively stationary enjoys a perspective of a vastly different order from that lent to another by his incessant mobility. It is frequently the case with the better couriers that on cresting an escarpment, one's eye detects a shorter route, perhaps through woodland, even a few hours earlier, impenetrable to the gaze, which, if taken, might halve his journey time. Just such a case occurred on leaving here. Even in retracing my steps several times, I might cover the same stretch and still have time to spare. But you require the plate. Why didn't she wrap it in a cloth or paper? A courier is used to eating in the saddle, singing in the saddle, dying in the saddle, probably. Yet she provides a plate, a plate she chooses not to bring herself. It's inconsistent. Thank you. Thank you for the sandwich. The message. I don't know what it says. I've... Oh, why did I... Oh, I've got... A dustpan! Fetch a dustpan, quick! Yeah. Not all of you! How should you know? You are the courier. The crisis. Its peculiar effects. A courier, whose honour and efficiency is beyond reproach, finds himself troubled by his ignorance of the contents of his saddlebag, when that ignorance is precisely what qualifies him for his task. <laughs> Everything that seems confirmed, self-evident, and beyond disputation suddenly is... Not suddenly. It will have seemed sudden when viewed in retrospect. In actual fact, it will imitate a cataclysm of the natural world, whose origins and subtlety are scarcely observed. The first few flurries of an avalanche, the rising of a river, and the uncommon anxiety of swans... Manifestations of overwhelming alteration, which only the most perceptive minds, those predisposed to welcome it, can sense before it topples and crushes them beneath its debris. If it does crush, some will be crushed, but others, they will obviously emerge. Me? I shan't emerge. Not you, no. When did I ever... I don't know. Ever, ever emerge. I haven't the time or patience to And think... what prevented this emergence? Others. Others! Yes! Yes! But now how insignificant that appears. Oh, splendid to live a life on horseback. Of course, it is easy to exaggerate the pleasures of an outdoor life. For one thing, in this particular region, we are blessed with too much rain. But even rain, if you were clad in oilskins, its faint patter on your hood might be music of sorts. Excuse me, miss. I'm certain as he gallops over flooded fields, the hooves of his white mare flinging turf into the air. He's in the 15th courtyard, miss. <laughs> Lost. How peculiar. When on previous occasions he was able to negotiate the entrance, he should now be sacrificing vital minutes by losing... I'll go to the tower. Go to the tower, and yes. And from the tower... Signal him. Precisely my intention. And wave. If he is unobservant, wave your skirt, your heart, your underwear. <laughs> you enrage everybody yes. by announcing what is obvious yes. when what is obvious is the very thing nobody wants to hear he's lost apparently lost wandering the courtyards like this a is lo ridiculous for some reason on departing here I turned left three times in succession when I knew perfectly well the opposite was the direction I required as I wandered from place to place I tried to understand the reason for this apparently willful miscalculation I deduced it was the effect of excessive repetition. I had memorized the instruction to turn right, but I should have done better to memorize the wall, the paving, the situation of a sprouting weed. But this was only the beginning of my troubles. Recognizing the gravity of my error, I resorted to the expedient of whistling my horse. A courier would. A courier. 
would not fail to summon his horse, if only to spare his legs by riding through the courtyard. And this I did. I whistled her, and certainly she heard, she heard, and she obeyed. Her loyalty was unimpeachable. But what neither of us understood was the holy deceptive nature of the echo in an enclosed space when the walls are of a, a certain height relative to the angle of tiled roofs. Thus, she always sought me in a place which, if I had visited at all, I had certainly left minutes or perhaps only seconds before she arrived there. I suffered the profound frustration of hearing her hooves clattering on cobbles which, for all I knew, lined the very courtyard next to that in which I stood. Yet running in this direction only rendered us further apart. <laughs> Predictably, such a nightmare could only be terminated by an accident. Coming past here for what may well have been the sixth or seventh time, I saw the broken pieces of the plate on which I think the sandwich had been served to me. Or possibly another plate from the same service. But all the same, sufficient to persuade me I had, if I had not succeeded in leaving at least regained my starting point. <laughs> Where exactly were the pieces of the plate? Uh, not far beyond the door. I do find servants odd. Oh, really? I do think that we must Very get odd. On. We must What get is on. it with servants? Who cares? Not simple idleness, surely. Nor, I think, is it malevolence. It is some... Obscure instinct. I wish I knew precisely which. And sometimes they are scrupulous. Could be the weather. I'm affected by the weather. Why shouldn't they be? Today, for example, it's oppressive. And these little flies. And still he lingers. I hate to utter what can only spoil the collusive nature of this silence, but... Or do I? No. Try honesty. The unplumbed horrors of authentic honesty. I don't hate it at all. I announce the peculiar lethargy of a courier. There. Hate away. He hasn't gone. Gone? No. He's still here. I'm breathless. Far from gone, his footsteps are, as it were, encased in lead. No longer the swift servant of his master Mercury, he has acquired the lumbering instincts of an antediluvian reptile for whom mud, not cloud, is his natural environment. All right. <laughs> lie down now. I will. I will lie down. I ran up the stairs. I've forgotten how many facts there are. I'm lying down. And the view is magnificent. I had forgotten how extensive the view is on a perfect day. But I was not there for the view. I was there to guide you through the courtyard. Well, certainly I was in dire need of it. I looked, but I saw nothing. Neither you nor your horse. A servant's negligence was my salvation. Good. Or else I might have wondered until your cries alerted me. If they did alert you... I must admit, as I leaned over the parapet, it occurred to me that my voice, which is not strong, would have been borne away on the wind. That's something the architect of this place never thought of. <laughs> if indeed it ever occurred to him that the tower might be one day employed to guide lost messengers through his labyrinthine courtyards. <laughs> Your father is correct, however, in his... He is not my father. How strange. I could have sworn. Nor mine, either. Not yours. Owens! Owens, please! Pick up! Pick up! Whose father is he, then? I said, whose father? I have been studying the law. And I have discovered that under the law, whatever your official status, your continued presence here constitutes a trespass. Is that so? Under the Acts of 1909. And that applies to government officials? Section 17, second paragraph. Uh, that paragraph has always been the subject of controversy. It may well have been. Some clarification was in preparation when the crisis developed, but so many details had accumulated from reports submitted by the couriers, some of whom had been abused, physically maltreated, and even in one instance, 
mauled by a bear that had been educated to identify couriers by the colour of their tunics. Then it required a whole contingent of lawyers to prepare even the draft legislation, but these lawyers are now scattered among the many emergency committees that have sprung up to provide for the exigencies of the crisis, causing me to conclude that however pressing the need for unambiguous codification of the law on trespass, we shall, for the present, need to show considerable restraint in our interpretation of the existing and unsatisfactory paragraphs. Not your father. But what else could explain We this? are not certain that you are a courier. Oh, but he... He has a courier's bag. Not only that. And on the bag, a badge. I wasn't referring to the badge. You could have stolen the bag. It's not the bag. Killed a bona fide courier. All and couriers use motorbikes. Forgive me, but are you suggesting that the fact of this particular imposter failing to procure a motorbike but appearing on a horse instead is precisely the evidence that satisfies you as to his authenticity? No. It's illogical. Yes. Yes, it is illogical. I think I intended to say that. How silly it doesn't matter to me whether he stays here or not! No. My point was this that had he killed a genuine courier about whose identity there is no question, he could not have been satisfied merely to steal his satchel, but intending to mislead others would have carried his act to perfection by appearing mounted on his victim's motorbike. That is my contention. It is dishonest. What is? What you're saying. Is it? Yes. Horribly dishonest. Is it? Why? You know perfectly well. Do I? I thought I was putting a case for something which needed clarification. I'm lying, it appears. Yes, well, of course you are. She's right. And this perpetual state of rightness is what so offends me. Look at her, throbbing, incandescent, with the satisfaction of exposing your flirtation with a stranger who quite possibly receives... Not a flirtation. ...receives a dozen such proposals in a single round. Not a flirtation, I said. Very well. Not a flirtation at all. If you call it a flirtation again, I shall do something. What? I don't know. I do all the violence round here. <laughs> Yes, you do. I am the monster. The word flirtation fills me with disgust. I hate the word, and you employ it precisely to humiliate my instinct. I apologize. Which I do not deny, repudiate, or suffer any shame for. I do not know if I love this man. I simply want him to kiss me. I have thought of nothing else since he came here. There. Perhaps you feel the same. Certainly not. Very well. You don't. I was moving beds into the conservatory. Do you want me to continue? It gives me no pleasure to be the cause of a dissension that has sprung up between you, I assure you. But whilst it might seem obvious that my swift departure would bring it to a close, things cannot be that simple. Can't they? Why not? You are in dereliction of your duty, which, if you are authentically a courier, must certainly result in your trial and execution since the death penalty has been restored for the duration of the crisis, and reluctant couriers will need to be made examples of, rightly, in my opinion. Call the servants. Quickly now. Quickly! Stop that! Stop picking up now! We're picking up now. We'll return to that another time. It's leafless, man. We know it's leafless. Escort this man to the gate. He has a horse, I understand. The horse also. And shut the gate behind him. Bolt it Bar it. Unpleasant, but we must accustom ourselves to things which in our other life we might have flinched from. Yes, that is how we recognize the crisis. Then come back and carry on. Now, please, leave the baskets. You do not need the baskets. Please. I feel sure you are making a mistake. How? In obliging you to carry out your orders? Quite possibly. How can that constitute a mistake? I don't know. You don't know why you should not carry out your orders? I cannot say with any certainty why I should not carry out my orders. On the other hand, many things suggest that these orders are perhaps not the most suitable orders. Or that even given their suitability, they are being frustrated by circumstances outside my control. Uh, 
for example? It's possible that the love she feels for me, sudden and unexpected as it was, is yet another manifestation of that innate obstruction to my mission that began so long ago with the substitution of a circus horse for a motorbike. Yes, yes, possibly. What you're saying is inconsistent. Every aspect of things that has hindered your journey has arrived in the form of an accident, at least as far as you are concerned. The provision of a horse when you had every reason to expect a motorbike, the fact of the horse's unsuitability for cross-country riding, the fact that on leaving here you forgot your saddlebag and your subsequent confusion in the courtyards all occurred in contradiction to your will. Your reluctance to continue with your journey is an altogether new factor, not circumstantial in the least, and motivated, possibly by cowardice, or desire for a woman who has had the misfortune to pity you. I don't pity you. Quickly now, escort him to the gate. Stop it. Oh, call it what you like. I have no choice. None. Bravo. Shut up. Bravo. <laughs> In the middle of that argument, I felt... Oh... That bottomless exhaustion of the soul that's like some vast bay in which the sea has died is motionless. I felt the corpse of the sea was underneath my ribs. But the words came. He drew me, staggering, back towards my suicide. The words came, however. The words came, yes. If he returns, it's you that must... Returns? Why should he return? Of course he will. He will. Why should I not tell? Why, when nothing else at all, nothing can justify my continuing? The blood revolving and the kidneys flushing liquids in their dark and thickening canals, gases, excretions, explosions in the bowel. I leak the truth from one orifice. <laughs> it's, a, it's the horse, you see. It's musical inclinations. Has he gone? Yes, miss. You saw him? Yes, miss. Riding? Galloping, miss. Galloping. Good. Baskets. Pick up now. We recalled him to his duty. And he did not look back. Never miss. There you are. The crisis has this effect on individuals, even those of criminal or idle dispositions, that they are rinsed, cleansed, wrung out of their melancholy introspection and... Uh, in a straight line? Undeviating, was he? Straight for the frontier, miss. Oh, I should have liked to see him. The cloud of dust raised by his horse's hooves. The frontier? The frontier, did they say? Which frontier? It's over there. I knew perfectly well the direction of the frontier. I wondered why they specified the frontier. Perhaps he... Did he say the frontier? Her mind. Oh, how it works. Her mind. Miss? Did he say the frontier? Did he use the word? He said nothing, miss. Not one word did he say. And yet they assert, without the slightest hesitation, that he was making for the frontier. You are becoming fretful. Am I? Remarkable mind. Fretful and ugly, yes. There are a hundred places to which a courier might be dispatched between here and the frontier. Places of no significance. Insignificant places, but who are we to judge their significance in a crisis? Quite possibly, the crisis has bestowed significance on farms and hamlets whose previous obscurity... I am quite prepared to be ugly! Poems, I assume. Oh, I do so want to see you, to witness you in full possession of yourself. I always have. Have you? I'm touched. Yes, but not at some appalling cost to me. Too bad. Am I supposed to cease becoming me for your... She's gone. Am I supposed to fade and falter in some airless half-life in order that... She's gone, like some plant, which instead of reaching for the sun, for fear of overshadowing its neighbours, willingly wilts, turns yellow in obscurity. Anyway, she's gone. I have stood five times at the door of suicide. 
twice in the moat, three times in the orchard, brought gasping from some smothering death, they prefer to pity me than that I should step into my own character. <laughs> too bad. Really just too bad. More baskets. Look, some there. And don't read. <laughs> this frontier... It explains everything. The courier is delivering the message that will terminate the crisis, and I sent him there. <laughs> you knew. How terrible that you know everything. And always did. Oh, don't touch. Oh, touch if you want to. Travel. Travel over me. <laughs> uh. <laughs> we encountered gypsies. These gypsies play violins. To be precise, one <laughs> viola and three violets. Mm. And whereas at one moment we were cantering, the next the mare had ceased in her velocity and like a puppet silently drawn up on strings was finally balanced on hind hooves. My astonishment was matched only by my frustration when she began to dance, to sway from side to side, drawing back her lips to whinny and equine Accompaniment. Your buttons are undone. For a while, this was humiliating. I, a courier on urgent business and carrying a possibly significant dispatch, which, so we were constantly reminded that the Academy of Messengers might alter the course of history. I was mounted on a dancing horse so captivated by the music of a band of peddlers she would not heed even the most savage application of the spurs. As for your skirt, your skirt, so I came back. Yes. Well, you had no choice. Oh, no, wait! No, wait! Wait! Oh, 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 And this road, this road to which the peddlers were fixed, it seems like greyhounds to a track. This road could not be bypassed. The fields which stretched on either side, meadows firm and flat, the courier deemed unsuitable. A certain sign of the deterioration of the imagination, I have witnessed this phenomenon in other walks of life. The courier's fatal fixation with the road. Leave her. Leave her now. Certainly, one must conclude that all things without exception conspire to delay the delivery of the courier's dispatch, not least the flesh of these no longer young, young women. Acts of this... vile acts like these, these distortions of relations are... Obviously, are manifestations of the crisis. Repellent, degenerate, but necessary. Possibly. I must wash. Oh, I'm all right. The crisis will certainly dispose of me, and that, I dare say, is its purpose. Why shouldn't I see it from my own perspective? 
I am entitled to conclude that the entire cataclysm that hangs suspended over the world has no other purpose than the disposal of a man who has outlived his time. A man arguably never equipped to have survived even his infancy, but who, through the untiring ministrations of a possibly deranged parent, was enabled to cling to life, to describe life according to his own distorted vision, and even to earn the love of certain women. But the game's up. They want the bed. These... Leaflets. And for whom? Some disemboweled wretch who cannot in his final agony possibly comprehend the meaning of his ordeal but believes it to be the consequence of the grinding engines of diplomacy. On the contrary, his agony is no more than a trivial side effect of a complex plan for my obliteration. These leaflets certainly belong to you. Me? Do they have my name on then? No. But all the same, the style is unmistakable. <laughs> the problem surrounding my return is complicated. On the one hand, by submitting to the musical fallibility of my horse, I was only fulfilling what must have been known, if not intended, by the Ministry. But, on the other hand, by not exerting myself to discover an alternative route, I went further than anyone might have predicted, for, as you implied, an expert courier would not allow himself to be frustrated by a gang of gypsies. It is impossible to avoid the conclusion that this building and its occupants have achieved an ascendancy over me, robbing me of that particular energy and enterprise that characterized me only a short time ago. But even that may have been calculated at the highest level. How am I to know? The fact of the matter is that the woman who was here just now not only expected me, but was glad of my return, notwithstanding my brutality towards her. How do you mean the leaflets are mine? The gates were barred. Closed, certainly. Barred and bolted. I leaned from the saddle, pushed... They swung open. They were not barred, then? Not to me. But others, leaning against them in an identical way, might have found them unyielding. I shall study servants. I shall keep a notebook in which I faithfully record which orders they adhere to and which they choose to ignore. I shall discover the characteristics of the latter and attempt to classify them. Armed with this knowledge, I shall know in advance of issuing instructions the likelihood of them ever being carried out. If we do not bar the gates, people come in. The gates are freedom. The gates permit us to discriminate between the welcome and the unwelcome. They are the fulcrum of hospitality. Miss. Pick up! Pick up! Even had the gates been barred, I must tell you, I think they would not have been effective. Given the narrowness of the moat and the generally poor condition of the walls, my return was probably inevitable. But the question which presents itself is not to do with my arrival, but rather the conditions under which I shall be able to achieve my third departure, if I am able to achieve it at all given the apparent fascination this place holds for me. Besides, the mayor is dead. Dead? The dancing horse, sensing how ill-equipped she was for the new conditions that will hold sway during and following the crisis, lost the will to live. And anyway, you galloped her, this heat. I forgot to water. Well, you say forgot. The watering of horses is surely an instinct of the courier. She... For these courts, You're right. I am perhaps no longer a courier. And despite the fact I carried out my tasks effectively for 20 years, this failure was certainly dormant within me. 
a sickness that the arrival of the crisis has unleashed, like some plague bacillus dormant in the rotting timbers of a balm, which uh, an unprecedented heat wave would... Of course, I might proceed on foot. It isn't such a very heavy satchel. It's not heavy at all. Your mare, she's all at once. Oh, a never-to-be-forgotten sound. A felled tree onto the cobbles of the yard. We ran and took her head. We lifted it. This mighty head in which the eyes were wide with bewilderment and... What is in the satchel? Anyway... A document, perhaps. Certainly, I have always taken it for granted that the thing I transported was, if not a document, an object whose associations were so powerful that it was, so to speak, a substitute for a document. A thing which might articulate more by its very appearance, its revelation, than whole sheaths of correspondence crafted by the finest poets and the most subtle diplomats working in tandem. This was the case on one occasion when I carried nothing but an empty lipstick case, a thing of no intrinsic value or artistic merit whatsoever, but which, when presented by me to a certain individual, caused her to display such agitation that I feared for my own life. Looking back on that period, I have no doubt that a number of military disasters, the decimation of promising cadets and the, the obliteration of certain villages could be traced to that transaction. Though I have no evidence to substantiate my claim. In this instance, however, the bag is empty. <laughs> Certainly that would relieve you of any urgency to reach your destination. Why? Because if there is nothing to deliver... Precisely! That nothingness is what he was required to carry. Yes! My unfailing vision. My repellent fingering of truth. I think you should shut up. Yes. For your own sake. Yes, your I should. Your life is in the balance. Of course it's possible I'm mistaken that this particular item is written on paper of so little substance as to be almost transparent, light and fragile as the wings of butterflies. But over 20 years, a courier becomes acutely sensitive to minor changes in the weight of satchels. And what's more, the expression on the face of the official who handed me this bag was distinctly sinister, pained, clouded, as if he sensed he was participating in a deception the outcome of which might prove fatal to me. An expression I have never seen on his face before. Open the bag. It's locked. Unlock it, then. Couriers do not have keys. The key is... Over the frontier! Yes. That's exactly where it is. And the individual who holds it is almost certainly expecting me. I think you have ceased to be a courier. I think whilst you feel yourself to be an honest servant of the state, the state has not been honourable to you. Honourable? I think you have been ill-used, furnishing you with a circus horse when it must have been perfectly obvious the poor animal was not bred to ride, and then to put precisely nothing in your satchel when you are risking life and limb transporting it. It's a mockery of your profession. I never thought of that. No. You are so dedicated, such ideas would not occur to you, but... If this is not a convent, what is it? Three women and a bedridden architect. Architect? Perhaps it is you who is dishonorable. Architect? The entire character of this place, the eccentricity of its plan causing me to lose my horse and probably intended to swallow me up in order that I might suffocate in some abandoned drain. The persistent coming and going of women so patently obsessed with fornication, nakedness and erotic oblivion. And this, this unbiddable family of fictitious servants will confirm my sense I have been made a victim of a conspiracy. Notwithstanding, I have three times chosen to incarcerate myself here. 
apparently at the behest of my own free will. What is that sound? Sound? Sound, yes. What is it? <laughs> Be quiet, Abel! I am profoundly lonely. And detecting my loneliness, you thought me vulnerable. Whereas, there it is again. It's a bell. A little bell. But frantic. Look for it! You! Me? Yes, it's all of you. Stop picking paper and look! There are 200 rooms here, Mr. Gadant. Leave the baskets! 200 rooms. Go into every one, and the cupboards open them. It will take them all day. Longer, possibly. They must be thorough. Take candles and stand at the head of every stair. And I shall know you are methodical. It stopped. Yes. It's stopped. I'm not an architect. Not an architect. No more. Am I a courier? Oh, God. You are the crisis. The crisis is you. <laughs> oh, my innocence. My intellectual lethargy, as if authentic crisis would stoop to represent itself in colours such as I described. I've read too much, and this reading inflamed my mind. I blame him. Doesn't everyone? Was it surprising that encountering, if not the crisis, the rumour of the crisis, I should picture it as crisis is conventionally described? The beds, the blood, the terrible shortage of bandages. I longed to tear my dresses into shreds for some child's wounds. No. This particular ordeal will be as poor as any other. The blow, whilst it might come from an unexpected place, will be, as ever, degenerate and nauseatingly mundane. You lurch from one conviction to another. Do I? For one brief moment, I thought, she is beautiful. She doubts. And then doubt went out like a light, smothered by another galloping intransigence. This man has violated me! Yes, and I am, believe me, tired of drawing your attention to... Yes, it was five attempts at suicide, and now... Yes, another triumph of evasion. I employ my pain to suffocate your criticism. There he goes again. Not a bell. Water. Violated you. Shh. Water. Cascading down the shaft of some bottomless well. Violated you. The bag is locked, but since the bag will never be delivered, since I am already in defiance of the law, it can hardly compound my offence to burst the lock or cut the leather. Violated her? But I loved you! Yes, but I was a different person then. I believed I was a courier. My destiny appeared to be entirely bound up with the exigencies of the ministry, but now I shall never leave this place. Again. I have a knife. Good. Shall I cut it or shall you? The seal's intact. We need only... Kill him! Kill him! Kill him? But he's the crisis. Give me the bag. The seal covers the lock, but... Ow! What have you done? It's all right. It's all right. It I... would seem obvious to anyone who thought about it that the bag is empty. It's but this very obviousness, the shrillness of the logic, makes me, for one, suspicious. I would go so far as to say Ow! that the bag itself is merely an element in a deception. But whose? Not the couriers, I think. Oh, I can't do it! The greater and no, more tantalizing prospect which now presents itself is that this courier, now no longer a courier, is himself no more than a whim. A spasm. Ow! Oh, do it, someone else! I will do it! Go away! 
in the universal and irresistible eruption of malevolence which now engulfs the world and which, like some ravenous monster emerging from the waves, can be satisfied by one thing only. Sacrifice! Whose? Whose sacrifice? Mine! I give up! You do it! Oh, the vanity of this man. And I thought I was vain. I think we ought to cut it. He thinks the accumulated rage of the entire universe, the boiling of youth, the wailing of widows, storms of violence and unrepentant criminality, all can be subdued by what? His own extermination? The effrontery of poets. You have to marvel. I do. I think we must slip the leather. Slit it, then. Give it to me. But it wasn't locked. Not locked. It's not empty, either. I said so, didn't I? Yes. Not empty, I said. We heard you. I'm unforgivable. I'm all the world detests. Neither locked nor empty. Oh, shut up, do. I'm hesitating. I'm hesitating to remove my hand. Why should I be anxious when what is in the bag was never intended for me? <laughs> Most likely it will be meaningless. A fragment of... It... It is... Meaningless. What is it? A photograph. It never occurred to me that the satchel was not locked. A photograph of a schoolboy. Always we underestimate the flexibility of the officials. As if routine itself could guarantee the inertia of the system. But no, they are discriminating. Show me. I must have made a thousand journeys for the ministry, and every time the bag was locked, I'm certain of it. And now, on this solitary occasion, which also happens to be my last mission, the item... I am the bearer of is of so little importance. We don't know that. Whether this document, which happens to be a photograph, is of significance or not, depends on its many meanings. For all we know, the schoolboy's face might have been sufficient on its own to provoke a revolution. And the fact your satchel was not locked, far from being deliberate, might only reflect the terrible anxiety the official suffered even in handling it. You said yourself he had a strange look on his face. No. The only subject for inquiry must be this. What is the child's identity? The child is you. Me. <laughs> Show me. <laughs> yes. It is me. The messenger has nothing to deliver but himself. And this spectacular redundancy is the triumph of the crisis. No wonder the official looked sad. He knew that never in his lifetime would he dispatch a messenger again. The crisis will see to that. This sad expression was undoubtedly the melancholy of a man who knows the world has ended in its existing form. No doubt a similar expression could have been discovered on your face when this building with its spires and turrets came into view. A sense of profound helplessness, such that even to lift a finger to avert it, to effect the slightest correction on the horse's rein, seemed... infantile. They have ceased to value poetry. At least as a means of coercion. From this moment on, poetry is restored to its original function. It has no function. So you say, and yet it was your verses that were being scattered over the land. Mine? Yes, and without regard to copyright. The most powerful sentiments of a distinguished mind drifting in profusion over a landscape inhabited largely by cattle, not one of whom... It's uh, perfectly true. I am an architect. ...was observed to do more than flick its tail in irritation. An architect? You, you said so yourself. As if a swarm of flies had descended from the heavens to add 
to their bestial burdens. You are a poet, and these are your daughters. Yes, the courier discerns. The courier detects. Intuitive, the courier. You have suffered long enough. The indifference, the abuse, the plagiarism, and now the wholesale dissemination of your work taken out of context and on paper of such dire quality. I cannot see you squirm a moment longer. Let us pray the crisis will destroy a world which could not tolerate your dazzling superiority. I am an architect. Up, up now. Your terrible ordeal is nearly over. The courier is a murderer. Up, up. Save me, save me. You say dustpan, you say quick, but are they quick? Do they have a dustpan? It is as if... Strip the bed, now! As if the simplest of instructions requires to be examined. They are like connoisseurs. They turn the order upside down, they hold it to the light... Take the pillows! Plus, just there! We have so many pillows. Oddly, pillows aren't in short supply. Take the end. Take those to the store. Look, his bed, his empty bed. We must talk about him. We, who have never talked of him, must talk. I found the well. The well, I first thought, was a clock. Did you not know there was a well? Peculiar. Because at first this place was like a maze to me, but now it is familiar as a kitchen must be to a cook. I could put my hand to anything. Uh, perhaps you'd instruct the servants to dig a grave for the no longer dancing horse. In this heat, corruption has accelerated and... Forgive my indelicacy. I have lived a life of solitude, and this, whilst not obliterating the tenderness of my sentiments, has to some extent robbed me of the facility for expressing them. Naturally, you will look on me with some distaste for having performed a task which... Yes. On the other hand, it was the very thing that he predicted. Quite. And not only predicted, he positively craved it. Yes. His horror of death, whilst pitiful to observe, was nothing more than the apprehension he experienced at every moment of decision. How true. And if the decision was not, in this instance, strictly his own, we all know how frequently he invoked his own death as something intimately bound up with the crisis. Only today. I think I speak for all of us when I say the passions we had known in him. Created in him. Yes. We created them. These passions were not recognisable anymore. It were impossible to recall when looking on that bed and it's... Unhappy. Unhappy occupant, yes. And if by some strenuous effort of imagination one could evoke those actions which... <laughs> yes, those actions which desire had driven us to perform... God, yes. A powerful embarrassment caused it to be swiftly repressed again. A doorway to a memory which barely opened was slammed again. Yes. If you had not disposed of him, she would have done. Yes. I don't flinch to confess it. She flinches at nothing at all. But why should she? She is magnificent. And the man who both created and subsequently maimed her personality paddling at this moment in a pitch-black well Shh. from which he can never emerge has already shrunk to occupy an infinitely obscure corner of her memory. 
a well itself down which no bucket of recollection will ever plunge, I dare say. Possibly not. Surely you, before you dropped him, slit his throat or something? I'm not sure that I did. Not sure that you... I, I didn't, no. I, I tipped him in. Alive? Alive, yes, because I distinctly heard him cry as he... Heard him cry? Yes. Where? Where is this well? Don't! Don't go! I think, looking at it from every point of view, to have you calling over the rim some apology or consolation will only serve to prolong his struggle, if he is indeed alive, and possibly stimulate him to another effort of valetudinary poetry. Whereas, abandoned and alone... His spirit, like some guttering candle, will be extinguished all the quicker. That's perfectly true. But how can she forgive herself for suffocating an impulse which, however it might complicate another's pain, is nevertheless human, spontaneous I and... I don't know. I don't know. I should have cut his throat. Or beat his head against the wall. But one must live with the consequences of one's actions, or, in this instance, with the actions one failed to perform. We are indebted to you, but the crisis alters everything, even the relation of debtors to creditors. If you set off now, you can find some lodging before dark. Set off? Yes. But I am not a courier. You are not a courier. Absolutely but not a courier. And I have met my bride. Carry her with you. Yes, we'll go. We'll go and... I'm not the bride. I love you, but the bride's not me. When you were here the time before, the time of your first or second visit, I can't remember which, I made you a sandwich. Second? Second visit, was it? And having made this sandwich, I chose not to deliver it. She wanted to. I wanted to, but great as this wanting was, I wanted even more for you to suffer the fact I had failed to reappear. I wanted my absence to wound you, and in wounding you to inform you of a need that perhaps had not been fully recognised. The need for me. It was not recognised at all. Not then. Nor at any other time. No. I had entirely misjudged things. It was I who delivered the sandwich. She delivered the sandwich, and as a consequence, it's also obvious in retrospect, she became the object of your fascination and... No, not at all. No? But you... The violence of my actions towards her later on was conditioned by so many things, I hesitate to place them in any order. Try. I will try. I can state with certainty that my behaviour was not compelled by any powerful feeling I harboured for you, either as a consequence of your delivering the sandwich or of any other of the numerous encounters that took place between us. Rather, it arose from observing your body fondled by the old man now swimming in the well. A touch of such profound possession, so intimate and yet so unresisted, I was seized by a rage of envy, a passion for usurpation swept over me, whose origins must have lain in my first glimpses of this place. It was a touch which, for all its beauty, condemned the senile poet to his death. It is impossible to like you, but you have perhaps dispensed with liking or with being liked. So have I. And far from being humiliated by your meditation that I was, in my indignity, nothing more than the instrument of your malevolence. Shh. Why, shh! Nothing was more loathsome to me than the idea that this inept and misappropriated courier shh. should have entertained feelings of insatiable desire for my naked flesh. You are too shrill. I might have been a chair. I might have been a cabinet on which you could wreak some petty havoc with a knife. I assure you, I feel wholly and completely disassociated from a sordid transaction which was threatening to... Calling, crying. My name. Yours, yes. Terrible cry. Yours because... Mine, why? Because you... Has the well a cover? A cover? A lid, a cover, yes. I 
don't recollect a cover, but I was agitated and quite possibly failed to recognise the existence of an object which... Miss! Yes. Miss! Yes. yes, it's all right. Master, Master from the cellars, cellars, miss. We know, we know, we know all about it. Now, take shovels and dig a pit in which to put the horse deep. Horses are so huge, and rains and frosts, a little winter, and up will come the hoofs. So deep, deep, please. Miss. Yes. It's self-evident to me that whoever made the world would not have failed to supply a lid for it. It is a very ancient world. So what? Far older than the house. Quite possibly. I am not an archaeologist, but the most cursory glance convinced me that the well is Roman. Is that so? And did the Romans not place covers on their wells? They preferred, perhaps, to fall headlong into them? I couldn't say. I am only attempting to suggest that the lid provided by the Roman well diggers has certainly at some stage in the passage of time either decayed or more likely been appropriated, possibly for firewood. If the lid was wooden? If it were wooden, yes. Whereas, if it were iron... I must go to the well. I don't think you should go to the well. I must do, mustn't I? It was my name he called. When I get to the well, I... It is a hundred metres deep. When I arrive at the well, I'll... I discern the depth more by accident than design. In stepping back from having tipped the poet in, I clumsily dislodged a section of the coping stone which fell away and plunged after him. I counted the seconds, being careful to distinguish the first splash from the second. I calculated the rate of acceleration... Why as... me, though? Certainly, it cannot be assumed that in calling your name he is expressing some greater need, some deeper affection. Not in the least. On the contrary, it might merely be a testament to your greater efficiency, his estimation that you, more than any of us, are equipped to extract him from the well. Yes, yes, that might certainly be the case. I'll come with you. Standing either side of the room, we could lean out, clasp hands, and, supporting one another, look directly down into the depths. You do not wish to join them, do you? Say if you do. I don't. Myself, I... Speaking as truthfully as possible, I must say that whereas I now regret failing to prevent his... to speak to anything at all, now he is gone, I... I shan't leap in. Or more precisely, I shan't leap in drawing you after me. We'll go then. I'm not certain if I wish to be your bride. <clears throat> what is a bride in any case? I've never been one. Presumably it's ecstasy. Ecstasy I've had. Yes, let's, let's. And afterwards. The slow grind of our degeneration. What is it now? The hole can hardly have been dug in such a short time. Measure the horse, mark out the length and width of it with chalk. Do not begin another hole, but using this... Miss! Yes, yes, we know. Calling, Miss! We are not, you. You are not the only ones with ears. Extend the hole in all directions. Hurry now and wait! When the hole is finished, attach ropes to the horse's hooves and pull it to the hole. Quick! It's cold in here. Kiss me. Quickly, kiss me. I'm not a bad person. I would not hesitate if I were bad to say so, but kiss, kiss. This work is peculiar. I know nothing whatsoever about wells, but looking at it from a general point of view, it would seem to me that falling 100 metres down a well shaft, suffering the glancing blows that would inevitably be inflicted during the descent, and plunging into ice-cold water, which might, if shallow, not even serve to soften the impact, could only impair an old man's grasp on life. Not so. He is, if anything, restored to vigour. The water is restorative. What other explanation is there? The Romans built a spa. 
This well, along with others, is situated above a stream, a spring, whose contents are so rich in minerals that even a brief immersion is sufficient to... The well must be filled in. Tell the servants. The servants are digging a hole. The hole must wait. The horse is putrefying. Yes, I recognize the odor of corruption just as well as you. Call the servants. The servants are fully occupied. Now, wait a minute. I am the bride. Forgive me, but... You. Me. Yes. Ask him. I am. I am. And this carries with it certain privileges, such as... But you don't love the Korean. Don't I? No, you don't. You make too much of love. You always have. Forgive me, but we are all familiar with your claims on this man. I know nothing of marriage. I only know I am the bride. Very well. Take the servants. Possibly the rubble which has been excavated for the horse's grave could be used to fill the well. I have never set eyes on a wheelbarrow. But he had no antipathy to wheelbarrows that I recall. And if there are no wheelbarrows, let them transport it all in buckets. Or failing buckets... Bowls. Bowls, yes. Or cups, for all I care. You are smothering your responsibilities. Am I? Good. Some uninvited stranger has insinuated himself into the melancholy grave of your ambition, <laughs> and like some thrusting weed has cracked you open, split your walls and tilted you <laughs> until your entire character has... My name? My name again? Stop digging! Follow me! I help! How hard it is not to be a messenger. Already I feel the terrible lethargy that comes from ceasing to occupy a vital function in the organization of affairs. You did not indicate the old man was your lover. And hers. All three of you. I should have known. My instincts were keener once. A glance was adequate to know the entire order of a household. Its contracts, its defaulters. Perhaps I was already failing. and Had I succeeded in delivering the message I was not intended to deliver, I should have been retired. Nothing escapes the officials. I have seen retired messengers. They grapple always with the agony that at some point in their careers their unsuitability was revealed. But when? They cannot sleep. They stare at the horizon, even retrace the journeys of their final years. Sometimes they are found dead in their mildewed uniforms. It is only hours since I ceased to be a messenger and already... I will give you messages. Why not? Why not mine? <laughs> The well. Sit down. Sit down. Not only the well, all that falls down the well also. My hands are filthy. Look. We threw down rubble. My hands. Are such a bowl. Rocks, bricks, anything. Soap. Yes. We can't do this. What can't you? What can't you do? We can't. We can't. We can't do this. I must lie down. Oh, God. I'll wash you. Shh. He's in there, miss. He is in there, yes. And the horse. Is she not in a similar position? The horse is dead, miss. Do not argue. Always you argue. What have you ever done that you were not driven to? The horse is dead. And the master is so nearly dead that... There is a difference, but so slight. And in all justice, one must say that whereas the horse was an innocent and inoffensive creature, he was so critical of life, so bitter and recalcitrant. To bury him under bricks could not be compared with burying another under bricks whose attitude was... He requires it, and so do we. 
It is obvious that in the bottom of a well, a man might be the subject of terrible perceptions that had evaded him in every other circumstance of his life. This flood of knowledge would certainly compensate him for the many terrifying aspects of his situation, and with certain men of intellectual character, even render the place preferable to the mundane influences of daylight, nourishment, human company, etc., that he was accustomed to in the world above. I think... To choose only one among many devastating truths that must certainly have presented themselves to him, he can only be luxuriating in the devastating discovery that in choosing from a world of women three to adore and be adored by, he was simultaneously selecting the agents of his own extinction. What distinguished them and at the same time delighted him? however unappreciated it was at a time, was their common capacity for murder. No wonder he is unaffected by cascading bricks. Possibly he experiences these bricks as a massage. Continue, please. Filling the well. This way. Or you will join him there! by ceasing to desire it. Listen, he cannot be recovered from the well. He is profoundly altered, and so are we. The world is, furthermore, no longer what it was. All this makes it impossible to contemplate the restoration of the conditions that originally prevailed. Now, you transport the bricks, and I... I will drop them in. <laughs> yes? Oh, yes. How hard it is. The crisis. Yes. <clears throat> will someone remove my boots? Oh. Remove your boots? I must confess, a certain chill suffuses me when, in spite of my reluctance, I am at intervals drawn as if by morbid fascination to contemplate the remainder of my life. A peculiar blindness descends on me, such as I have on rare occasions known in blizzards or in fogs. I cannot discern what lies ahead. This does not prevent me making progress, only this progress is predicated on an act of faith, namely the continuing existence of the road. Remove your boots. Quite possibly the road is, is finished, or worse, leads into quicksands, or over a cliff. The one who is my bride. She surely should remove my boots. Yes, I should. His cries have ceased. Or if they have not, I have ceased to hear them. Certainly, he knew many things, 
But for all that he exerted to the full his powers of logic and experience, he succeeded only in acquiring the barest understanding of this house and its inexorable character. Whilst he was able to discern that his purpose in coming here was far from being the consequence of mishaps, a mission, the outcome of which was the removal of the old man from his bed in seeking to select from among the three of us a bride, he merely announced his own extinction. <laughs> Yes, do cry. I could almost cry myself. It is so fragile, this misunderstanding we call love. Now you must go. Go? Both of you. Yes, before I damage you. Go? Yes, with hats and coats and little bags. Why? Through the rockets and the firestorms, you must leap onto the running boards of trains. What? In no matter what direction, because... I don't see why! I shall certainly destroy you. Hurry now. She says that because only because she is certain we can only fail. That whilst we shall attempt to go, we will return. Our coats and hair and courage dragging in the dust... That is the extent of what appeared to be, for one fleeting moment, her generosity. Possibly. It's hard to tell what anybody's kindness might conceal. I've ceased to wonder. Coats! Your mistresses are leaving! Bats! Yes. Stop digging now! Yes. And just as you do not know the reason for your wishing us to go... I do not know the reason I intend to, but... Good. But leave. We must. Yes. Kiss me. Kiss me, please. Miss. They're going, yes. Oh, oh miss. miss. Both, yes. Fetch their things and quick. Oh. Nothing that kept us here for so long anymore exists. Not even the spectacle of your appalling struggle with yourself, to which we were only reluctant witnesses, and yet... Oh, even you are trawling for a pretext to stay in this house. So it seems... Madness! There, take the coats. You never know what might. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get up now. You're not hurt. Climb the tower, all three of you, and look. In one of the 13 courtyards, you will see the bodies of your mistresses. Together, or possibly apart. When you have ascertained this, Return to me with the precise location etched upon your minds. <laughs> they won't come back. Oh, God! Their loyalty was wholly conditional. Conditional on what? Let go of my hand. On the theoretical nature of the crisis. Let go, I said. Once the crisis ceased to be an aspect of your character and began to manifest its authenticity, they... Please. Naturally, they... Please. Took to their heels. I hate this bad. Hate it? Why? 
As I lay on the bed, I experienced such an access of clarity that for some time, quite possibly, I ceased to breathe. This would explain the mistaken diagnosis that I was actually dead. But far from being dead, my brain was seething with the most lucid explanation. <laughs> Do not move. The circus horse, the gypsy fiddlers, even the expression on the face of the civil servant, everything was bathed in a luminous, not to say blinding logic. <laughs> Do not move from what is now your bed. <laughs> Mine! It is you that keeps me on the bed! Obviously it's me. Let me up! Everything is me. Let me... go. Oh, please. It horrifies me to be horizontal here. Oh, please. In A House of Correction, Shardlow was played by Juliet Stevenson, Vistula by Jenny Stoller, and Lindsay by Victoria Wicks. David Bradley was Hebel, and Nicholas Leprevo, Gdansk. The servants were played by Shirley Dixon, Johan Meredith, and Patience Tomlinson. Music composed and performed by Elizabeth Parker. A House of Correction by Howard Barker, was directed by Richard Wortley and was an independent production by Catherine Bailey Limited for Radio 3.